My name is Randy. I'm one of the associate ministers here at Eagle Christian Church. And, and Steve, our senior pastor, is back from Israel, just spending the weekend recovering and resting from his time uh, abroad. But I'm, I'm excited to be here with you this morning and just really honored and just feel very privileged to be able to come in here with you this morning, to spend time together worshiping, to spend time remembering Jesus and, and the blood that covers our sin. And now we're really gonna look into to God's word for direction for our life. And before we jump into to Psalm 32, I just wanna ask you a question. And the question is, have you ever wrestled with sin in your life? I, I can see that maybe some of you have. And I know that I have as well. You know, statistically speaking, when it comes to, to sin even in the church, we find that the statistics are not that different for, for sin in the church and people who struggle with sin and commit sin in the church than what it is beyond these walls. In fact, we hear about it all the time. Preachers who admit to an inappropriate relationship with, with a woman or, or with someone that they shouldn't be spending time with. We, we hear about it and think and, and, and see it all the time as, as people involved in the church, people who are committed to, to doing ministry in the church, even Sunday school teachers and, and leaders in the church who struggle with things like pride and things like anger, things like truthfulness. I think all of us can, if we're honest with ourselves, at least admit that we struggle with this issue of sin. We know the power of it and the tension between what God has called us to do and what maybe we feel like we want to do, we feel that tension in our life almost daily. But I'm here to remind you this morning that there is good news. And the good news comes to us from, from, the, from the prophet David in the, in the 32nd Psalm. Really, it's, it's good news that we can go to God and we can find mercy and grace and peace and forgiveness because he is available to us. Go to him while he may be found. Isn't that good news? Isn't it amazing? If you've got your Bibles with you and, and want to follow along, Psalm 32. It's a maskal of David, and it goes, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I was silent, my bones wasted away, and through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I, I will counsel you with an eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright, in the Lord. This is an amazing psalm. And I think one that, that touches our lives deeply, and one where we can walk away from today and, and really think about what it is that God is calling us to, how we need to go to him in those times of failure, those times of, of sin and shame. You know, this is a maskal of, of David, written by David, and, and maybe many of you in your Bibles have a footnote for this word maskal, saying that it's a, a liturgical term or, or maybe a musical term. Actually, it's a, it's a term that means giving of instruction. This is one of 12 psalms that has this, this ascription at the top, a maskal. But in addition to a teaching psalm or a psalm that really gives instruction, this is also classified as a, a psalm of repentance. There, there are a total of, of seven psalms that are really classified as psalms of repentance. And as we think about the psalms, we understand that five of these are written by none other than King David. And I want you to just get a sense for these psalms and their plea to God to come and make a difference in their life. Psalm 6, O oh Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, but be gracious to me. Psalm 32 that we just read, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Psalm 38, O oh Lord, rebuke me not in your anger. Psalm 51, again written by David, have mercy on me, O God, 
according to your steadfast love. Psalm 102, hear my prayer, O Lord. Let, let my cry come to you. Psalm 130, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Psalm 143, hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my pleas for mercy. You get a sense for how these psalms are, are authentic prayers coming to God, asking for mercy and grace, and, and for him to really deal with our sin and with our shame. Out of these, these repentant psalms, really the most popular are, are Psalm 32 and Psalm 51 that are really written by, by David as a result of his adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. I mean, many of us are familiar with that story, and I would encourage you, if you want to read more about that, to go to 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. But, but we understand that, that David commits adultery with Bathsheba, a woman that's not his wife, and she conceives, and as a result of that, David tries to cover up his sin. He plots and he schemes to have Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, murdered. And after everything is all said and done, and maybe David is feeling a little bit relieved that the whole thing has been covered, his sin is, is confronted. That there's a prophet, man's, God's man, by, by the name of Nathan, who comes and, and confronts David and calls him out for his sin. And as a result, David writes these psalms. Psalm 51, probably written first, just really uh, after that, that time of confrontation, and I would encourage you to go there and, and read through that because it really does breathe with emotion as David is crying out to God, asking for him to, to create a clean heart in, in him and to restore his spirit back to him. It's an amazing psalm. Psalm 32, probably written later, maybe as David looked back and, and realized what he had learned about sin and what he had learned about mercy and grace and forgiveness and how God deals with, with sin. But as a result of this, David really does walk away different. And really, that's my prayer for us this morning. As we look into God's word, maybe for each and every one of us to really think about, God, what is it that you're calling me to do? Or how, do you, how are you calling me to be different because of your word, because of the words of David that he shared with us? He's a great church father by the name of Augustine. And, and Augustine said that Psalm 32 was his favorite psalm. In fact, he had it inscribed on his wall and he meditated upon it day and night. Augustine said this. He said, the beginning of knowledge is to know oneself to be a sinner. May we too understand ourselves, understand our, our situation before a holy and a righteous God. You know, it's interesting because Psalm 32 really does begin with this, this jubilant note, really expressing the joy of the person who has been forgiven. And I just want to remind you, this is, this is the second psalm that really begins this way, with this word blessed. Psalm 1, the very first psalm, begins with blessed is the person who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Blessed is the person who walks in God's way. And it's interesting here because we see that blessed is the person who maybe hasn't followed God's plan, but who has found forgiveness and mercy and grace and restoration. You know, I think in, in order for us to, to really understand the blessedness of this repentance and forgiveness, David writes this psalm, Psalm 32. And it's interesting because as we look at this psalm, even in the opening verses, we see the, 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 an example of beautiful Hebrew, Hebrew poetic parallelism. We actually get three words for, for sin in, in the first couple of verses, and we get also three corresponding words that help us understand how God deals with, with our sin. These are not just simply synonyms, but, but they're specific words that are chosen to cover the entire spectrum of sin. And for us to really understand the whole scope of God's deliverance from sin, how he meets us in our time of need and delivers us. You see, really David, as he writes this, in many ways, as I've studied through this, I'm thinking he's writing to me because I need to understand this message. I need to understand this and apply this in, in my life because David, even as he begins, he wants his audience to understand, number one, the, the consequences of sin. Sin's consequences. In fact, verse three says, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away 
through my groaning all day long. And here's the thing I think David wants us to understand. Sin is destructive. Sin is ugly. It is a terrible thing. And even as we think back to to David's experience with with Bathsheba, we kind of get the idea that at first David doesn't even realize the negative consequences of what he's doing. In fact, he is seemingly unaware of his sin until he's confronted by the prophet Nathan. And Nathan confronts him and he tells him a story. And he tells him a story about two men. One man is, is rich, and he's got lots of flocks and lots of herds. The other man, very poor, and only has but one little sheep. The rich man has a guest come into his house, and, and as he thinks about preparing him a meal, he ponders the thought and actually acts out on the thought of going and stealing the one sheep from this poor man, rather than taking from his own flocks. So he steals this sheep, this one sheep that this man has, and he feeds it to his guest. And David is outraged. David looks at Nathan and says, tell me who that man is, and I will go and set things right. And David, Nathan looks at him and says, you are the man. In that moment of confrontation, it seems like, like David understands the gravity of what he's done. And Psalm 32 here, as he even reflects upon what he's done, he he really does explain the results of his sin and what's going on in his life. Just look at this language. His bones wasted away. He groaned all day long. God's hand was heavy upon him and and his strength was dried up. David is explaining that during that period of time, he was empty. He was destroyed. He was defeated. Defeated. You know, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter six, and and he puts it this way. He says, for the wages of sin is is death. He's wasted up, he's dying, he's he's destroyed and he's defeated. And I'm just wondering, have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt just the emptiness of sin and how destructive it is in, in your life? I know that I have. It's not a fun place to be. And I think it's especially true of of people who are living maybe a lifestyle of sin. And they don't even really realize what's going on in their life until maybe they've been delivered from that. And then looking back on it, they realize, I was dying. I was empty. I was depleted. This idea that hindsight is is 20-20. And as David really shares with us in Psalm 32, we, we, we get these amazing words really talking about sin so that we can understand exactly what it is in verse one he uses this word transgression it is really the hebrew word that literally means revolt or rebellion it is the picture of a soldier who is under someone's authority but instead of submitting to that authority he chooses to do what he wants to do he chooses to go his own way and in this case sin is really a deliberate decision to revolt against God. And the thing that makes sin so dreadful is not only a, not that it's only an offense against people, but sin at its very root is an offense against God, against who he is. It's offensive to him. In fact, David understands this. In fact, Psalm 51, he writes, and he says, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And I don't think David is trying to diminish what his sin had, had caused other people, the, the grief and the pain that he had caused maybe Bathsheba or, or Uriah or even the nation of Israel as they, all, as they all deal with the consequences of what David has done. But what David is saying is in light of a sin against God, th- those matters really do pale into, in comparison. His sin is an, ascent, is, is an offense against God. It's a transgression. It's a revolt. It's a rebellion saying, I'm going to do what I want to do, irregardless of your authority over me. But also notice this next word. In, in verse 1, we also get the word sin. It's a Hebrew word that really means failure. And this really describes an act that misses intentionally God's expressed and revealed will. This is not of the person who, in their very best efforts, is trying everything that they can to do to do what they know God would want them to do. No, this is actually someone who who knows that the target is over here, 
But instead of shooting at the target, they decide to shoot in the complete opposite direction. This is the person who understands, God, your will is this, but me, I wanna do this. And this is what I'm gonna do. You see, it's that intentional desire to choose my will even when I know exactly what God would want me to do, even when I know God's will. You see, this, this is David knowing that adultery is not God's plan, but yet choosing to do it anyway. This is David knowing that murder is wrong, but he says, I don't care. I'm gonna do it anyway, because I've gotta look good in this situation. It's all about me and what I want and what's best for me. Sin is this deliberate failure to do what we know God would want us to do. And he's told us specifically in his word how it is that he really wants us to live life. God is the creator of life. He's the one who designed us. He knows how we should live life. Not just any kind of life, but really a full, abundant, meaningful life. And when we choose to say, I'm gonna do what I wanna do, irregardless of God, we end up in a very miserable place. In fact, this next word, in verse two, we get this word iniquity. It's really a word that means crooked or or wrong or corrupt or or twisted. You see, the first word transgression really describes sin in view of our relationship to God. God, you're an authority, but I'm rebelling against that authority. The second sin, that second word describes sin in relationship to God's law. God, I know what your law is, but I'm gonna do what I wanna do. And really this third word, this word iniquity, really describes sin's effect on you and me. See, sin is is destructive. It, It perverts us. It twists us, and as we indulge in it, we become perverted and twisted. And we, who have been in the church, understand how destructive it can be as we look and we see sin's effects on the lives of those around us. But not just on their lives, but even in our own life. We, we can look even to the opening pages of the Bible, and we can understand that God created the world in perfection. He created man and woman and put them in this place of perfection. He had harmony with them. He had relationship with them. There was nothing there to scar and mar them. But then as sin came into the picture, we see what happened. There was anger. There was hatred. There was lust. There was murder. There was deceit. And those things twisted us. As a result of sin, we're we're broken. It destroys us. And David is wanting us to know just how destructive and ugly sin is. And it is a terrible thing, and we're all in the same boat. We're all sinners. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes again in Romans chapter three and says, for we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. We are all sinners in need of a righteous God and a God who will forgive us and restore us. We all stand condemned or in desperate need of his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness, the kind that only comes from him. And that's exactly where David points us here in this psalm. In fact, he shows us God's forgiveness. He says in verse five, I acknowledge my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. What a beautiful realization. You see, David understands that that God is the one who alone can provide forgiveness. And in Psalm 32, he shows us what God does with our sin. In fact, he uses three corresponding words to really help us understand how how God deals with it and how he forgives us. In fact, verse one, he says our transgressions are forgiven. It's the Hebrew word that literally means to lift off. It's the act of removal of sin. It's a beautiful word. It's a beautiful concept. You see, before we take our sin to God and confess it, it's like a weight around our our neck. It's heavy on our shoulders. It's burdensome. And it wears us out. 
But when we take it before God, he lifts it from our shoulders. In fact, Psalm 103 tells us that that God removes it as far as the east is from the west. Isaiah chapter 43 tells us that, that God remembers our sin no longer. It is forgiven, it is removed, it is lifted off. That's good news. It's good news for you and for me. Also in verse one, we get this, this other word, the word covered. It's an amazing word, and it's a word that, that really has a strong religious background. It's really taken from, from the day of, of atonement. You see, on the day of atonement, the high priest would go into the, the holy of holies in the temple, and he would take the blood of an animal, and he would sprinkle it on the, the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. It was really a, a symbol showing how the blood really shields God's judgment from the people. It's an amazing image to know that the sin can be covered, covered by the blood. In the New Testament, we get the word propitiation. And this is really where where sin is being covered, not by any blood, not by the blood of sheep and lambs and, and goats and bulls, but really covered by the blood of Jesus, God's very own son who gave his life for us. Here's the thing. When we come into a relationship with God, when we come before him and confess our sin, God looks at us and he doesn't see the sin. He sees the blood of Jesus. It's been covered. Not only has it been removed from us, but it has been covered by the blood of Jesus. And God sees the precious blood of Jesus and not you covered with the scars and the effects of sin. That's good news. That's that's not just good news, that's great news. And in verse two, we also get another, another phrase, another thought. We get these words counted no longer. And David really states this in in the negative. What what God does not do, he doesn't impute or count against us our wrongs, these sins. It's really a bookkeeping term, and it's a concept that Paul picks up on in, in, in the New Testament. In fact, what he says is he says he writes our sin into Christ's ledger, and Jesus pays it. But not only that, but he writes the righteousness of Christ into our ledger, and that's what we get. The price has been paid, And we have been declared redeemed and innocent and righteous, not because of anything that we've done, but because of what Jesus has done, because of the blood that has covered us. What an amazing thing. And I like what the Apostle John writes in 1 John chapter one. In fact, he puts it this way. He says, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a beautiful verse. Maybe it's a verse that you need to highlight or maybe you need to underline so that you can go back to that when Satan tries to hold those sins up in your face and convince you that you're still under the weight of those sins. We can be forgiven, we can go before God and we can have our our sins taken care of, they can be removed from us, they are covered. Isn't that good news? Isn't that amazing? Aren't you grateful for what Jesus has done? Because we're all sinners. We're all in need of his mercy. We're all in need of his grace. And you see, that's the lesson that David learned. And again, he learned it and he shared it with us. You see, we're gonna be forgiven because of Jesus. The forgiveness is gonna be complete. It's gonna be immediate. And that mercy and that grace, that forgiveness is gonna transform our lives. It's going to change us. And it did David as well. In fact, God's mercy and grace really does lead to to our response. David says in in verse eight, therefore let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. You see, David experienced this this forgiveness and, and this mercy and this grace, and it changed him. He went before God while he may be found, and it changed him. In fact, David's forgiveness led him in a number of areas. And really three that I wanna share with you this morning. Number one, it changed him because he made a commitment to take what he had experienced, what he had learned about sin and God's mercy and grace, and he said, I am gonna teach others. In fact, in in Psalm 51, David writes and says, then I will teach transgressors your ways and, and sinners will return to you. In Psalm 32, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. You know, we have Psalm 32 and Psalm 51 
in our Bibles today to teach us, to lead us, because David made a commitment that I'm gonna use this very difficult thing, this very shameful thing, my story about my failure and about how God has forgiven me and restored me, and I'm gonna share it. I'm gonna teach it to others. And maybe there are some of you here today who have dealt with sin and it's been terrible and it's been negative and it's been destructive, but you've also understood the power of forgiveness and the amazing grace that has restored you. You have an amazing story of, 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 of sin and redemption in your life. What would it look like if you took that story and maybe shared it with people so that they too could know about the destruction of sin, to know about the amazing grace and mercy of God. Maybe you need to make a commitment to leave today and say, I'm gonna share my story with my kids because I don't want them to go down and struggle the way that I did. But I want them to know that if they do, God's grace and mercy is sufficient for them. Maybe there are grandkids that you need to share your story with. Maybe there are parents you need to share your story with. Maybe you're in a small group and maybe you need to make a decision to go and to share your story of, of sin and redemption with your small group because maybe there's someone in that group who needs to know the story, to understand the destruction of sin, to understand the, the, the amazing grace of God to restore you and to make you whole. But it wasn't just to take a, what he's learned and teach others. David had this real commitment, this real desire to experience complete restoration. Psalm 51, I just wanna read a few verses to give you a flavor for the kind of redemption, the kind of, of restoration that, that David is crying out for. He says, have mercy on me, O God, and according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant, uh, abundant mercy, Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than so. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and restore a right spirit within me. You get a sense for how desperately David wanted to be whole again? Do you get a sense for, for how much he wanted to be restored back into right relationship with God? A commitment to go and teach others, but also a commitment to, to experience restoration and to have that in his life. And I know that he experienced that kind of restoration because he was also able to stand and to say, I am gonna praise God. And maybe that's something that we need to make a commitment to do in our lives as well. To experience that restoration, but not just to experience it so that we can be whole again, but experience it so that we can reflect it back to God and to praise him for it. In fact, I like how David puts it in Psalm 32. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, so righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Even in Psalm 51, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my, my lips and my mouth will declare your praises. As a result of his restoration, David made a commitment to stand and to praise God for who he is and what he's done in his life. What an amazing transformation. What an amazing thing. And we could go on and on. There's so much in these psalms that really resonates in our life. But I think the application for you and me is, is really obvious. As we look at the psalm, as we think about, God, how is it that you want me to leave here maybe different than I first showed up? Maybe it's just simply a decision to say, I understand the sin is destructive, sin is ugly. I'm gonna do everything that I can to avoid sin in my life. To make a commitment to, know, to say, God, I know this is what you want me to do, and I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna aim for that target, I'm gonna do my very best to follow your path, to walk in your ways. And maybe you need to, you need people to maybe help you do that. We're here as a church. We would love to spend time with you. We would love to show you what that looks like, to help you as you, as you make a commitment to follow God, to avoid sin in your life. Maybe for some of us, it's simply a realization that God's mercy is great. Maybe there are some of us here this morning that know exactly how David felt because you're feeling that right now. Your bones are wasting away. 
You're, you're groaning. You're, you're empty. You're depleted because of sin in your life. Maybe for some of you this morning, it's a decision today to say, I'm gonna call out to God and seek forgiveness for the sin in my life. And I'm not gonna wait till tomorrow. I'm not, I'm not gonna wait till next week. I'm not even gonna wait till, till this evening. I'm gonna do it now. I'm gonna call out to him now because I can't wait. I can't wait any longer. Maybe for some of us, like I've already talked about, it's just a decision to leave and to say, I'm gonna teach others what I've learned about sin and the mercy and grace of an amazing God who loves me and loves you too. Maybe that's a decision that some of us need to make as we leave this place today, but for all of us, because I know that we're all sinners and that we all need God's amazing grace. And many of us have experienced his grace over and over and over again, more than we ever deserve. But because of his grace, may we all be able to stand and to praise him because of his love for us. Because of the fact that he sent Jesus into our world so that we would not have to pay the price for our own sin. But that we can trust that his blood will indeed cover us. And we can be whole again, we can be restored again into right relationship with God, not because of anything we've done, but because of what Jesus has already done for us. What an amazing thought. There's no greater blessedness really then for you and me to understand that we can be forgiven, that there is amazing grace waiting for us. You know, there's a, a hymn that we sing from time to time here at Eagle Christian Church. It's a hymn that, that many of you are, are very familiar with. It's called It Is Well With My Soul. It's written by a, a guy by the name of Horatio Spafford, and it's written at a very low time in, in his life. But I love what he did with the second verse. In fact, in the second verse, in the midst of, of great grief and, and, and great just, just trials in his life, he was able to write these words, my sin, oh, the bliss of that glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, it is well with my soul. My deepest desire, my greatest prayer for us this morning is that we would leave and we would know that there is mercy and grace. It's been nailed to the cross. We don't have to bear it any longer. Father, I am so grateful for the opportunity to be here this morning. And Father, for the opportunity that we have to look into your word and look for direction in our life. Father, thank you for these psalms. Thank you for for David's, David's failure that, that led him to the point where he was able to speak of your amazing love and his, your, your amazing grace in his life. Father, I'm praying for each and every one of us here this morning that as we leave this place, we would understand how much you love us and how much you care for us and how much you want to restore us into right relationship. And I pray for some that are here this morning that, that maybe this would be the first step for them to be restored to be in right relationship, to deal with the issue of sin in their life, maybe for the very first time. Father, we're asking your spirit to surround us, to lead us and to guide us. And Father, as a result of who you are, as a result of what you've done, may each and every one of us in this room make a decision to praise you. Praise you for your mercy, praise you for your grace, praise you for loving us, for restoring us. Father, that's our prayer. And we pray this in the name of Jesus.